Hi, everyone. Welcome to our book club favorites event, where we will be discussing Elizabeth McNeil's newest novel, Circus of Wonders. We are joined today by Elizabeth, who you also may know from her internationally best-selling novel, The Doll Factory. Elizabeth is joining us from England, and we are also joined by Caitlin, our marketing expert for this book. Um, and before we get into our discussion, I wanted to let everyone watching know that we will be giving away five copies of Circus of Wonders. To enter for your chance to win, just leave a question for us in the comment section of this video, and we will do our best to answer as many questions as we can live on screen today. Um, and now we'll get into book club. Elizabeth, I just loved the dazzle and excitement of the atmosphere of the circus. And I know so many of our book club members did too. Um, but for any of those who may not have read the book, uh, can you give us a brief summary of what Circus of Wonders is about? Of course. Um, so it's a story of, sorry, just a second, it's Sorry, just a very slight technical issue. Um, so it's a story of power and spectacle and greed and belonging and fame and love. And it's set in Victorian England and it's about Nell. And she's a girl whose skin is speckled with birthmarks. Um, and it actually begins with Jasper Jupiter's Circus of Wonders arriving in her small coast, coastal town and her father selling her to the ringmaster. So with this sort of very dramatic incident, um, her life is really transformed. And at the beginning, it's kind of tragic, but Really, the book is about Nell's quest to tell her own story. And as her fame grows, what happens when her fame threatens to eclipse that of the showman who bought her? It is just so fabulous. And I love Nell. She's just such a mm -hmm. such a star. Um, and speaking about just the setting of it and how much I loved it, um, we I've been noticing that you are pretty drawn to the Victorian age in London. Um, the, the Doll Factory and Circus of Wonders are both set in that um, time period. Um, I'd love for you to discuss a little bit about what draws you to the Victorian London atmosphere. Yeah, of course. So um, I think I, sorry, just a very small point. I'm getting slight feedback of myself coming back. So I'm just sort of putting it on mute when I'm talking, but taking it off. So we can um, hear you loud and clear, sure so don't worry. Anymore. But um, really sorry about that. And thanks everyone who's listening in. But um, yeah, so I've always been fascinated by Victorian London. And like, even when I was a kid, my best friend and I, we used to um, kind of dress up as Victorians and we used to even just get these plastic bags and shove them down our knickers and pretend that they were bustles. <laughs> so yeah, I think even at that early age, I was kind of drawn to that sort of world. But I think if I were to pinpoint it, um, I think that even then I was fascinated by it because it's this age of power and change and ambition. And these are all things that I find completely fascinating. And we see all of those things in the Victorian circus and it exploded in this age. It was really when the circus became, you know, came to the forefront of society. Um, and it was all because of, you know, this technological change where, you know, word and fame could spread with the introduction of printing presses and train travel and celebrities could kind of be manufactured in this world, which is what we see with Nell. And even, you know, vast menageries could be gathered and then traveled to tiny remote villages. And I just of thought what would it like to, what would it feel like to see all of this to be part of that experience and that wonder um but with all of that of course with all of this possibility of fame and money and power there's also greed and ambition and jasper jupiter he's determined to own the greatest show in the world <laughs> Yes, he is. Um, and so we've touched on a couple of characters now, Nell and, and Jasper, um, but this book is just full of um, really interesting and very complex characters. Um, so can you talk a little bit about maybe your writing process for getting into the heads of so many voices and so many characters? And then maybe which is your favorite character that you got to write? Oh, well, I, I really actually, so so the book is split into those three perspectives. Um, so maybe I'll give a little bit of, bit of information about each of the three characters. So there's Jasper and he is this, um, as I mentioned, he's this very ambitious ringmaster. And then there's Toby and he's his brother who works basically assembling the circus, a kind of dog's body, I guess. Um, and he lives in his brother's shadow, which is of course a source of much tension between them. <laughs> and then there is Nell, the protagonist who I mentioned, who is, who is sold by her father to the show but um 
I think that writing in these three different perspectives, I think that, you know, perspective is almost uniquely suited to the circus. You know, it's full of jostling characters. It's full of um, bias and different ways of seeing things and telling things and illusion. Um, and you can really kind of explore that with different contradictory characters. Um, and I loved actually getting into all three of their mindsets and how differently they saw the world. And, you know, because all three of the, the plot, really, I suppose, it comes from those three characters, what they want and how what they want kind of rubs up against each other and grates against each other. And that is what kind of creates the tension and the climax in the book. Um, so getting into that mindset and the psychology of characters who were then going to butt up against each other was was really fun actually um but i'd say it's really hard to choose a favorite character um because you know i have such fondness for nell and there's a softness <laughs> to toby um mm -hmm. but then when i came to write jasper's chapters i'd kind of have fun with kind of the the vibrancy and the brashness of him and in a way i kind of hope that the reader feels the same way that i did when i was writing it that each character kind of feels like a refreshing shift from the other where you see something in a slightly different light or it moves the story forward. So I guess maybe it's a cop out, but I didn't have a favorite character to write because as soon as I finished writing one chapter, I just felt ready for what the next character was going to bring. And I think that's a wonderful point because, um, you know, to you, they all have so much to offer, right? You know, writing Nell is so fun. Writing Toby, like you said, has that softness um, that must have been such a joy to write. Just someone who was uh, had such, I don't know, said a complexity, and he he was soft, but he also you know got tough, and and he had to find his his inner toughness. Um, and then Jasper just seems like you just kind of let all your <laughs> your inhibitions go and be you know as <laughs> wild as you can be, which does seem as a writer just a fun fun experiment. So yeah, not a cop out. I can totally understand. <laughs> yes, I agree, and I do want to hang on to Jasper just a little longer because he was such a dynamic character. Um, you know, he has he's a little bit untrustworthy. He's got this, you know, this whole dynamic of ringing in this circus. Um, and some might see him as kind of the villa, villain of the story, but also in some ways, he's also this like savior to the misfits and the strange people who come into the circus setting. So he's really, he's really a dynamic character. And I'd love to just hear from you, Elizabeth, about um, kind of how you were hoping to portray him. If you're explicitly having him be this evil character or kind of your thought process behind him a little a little more yeah sure so um i guess as a writer i'm not so interested in writing a straightforwardly evil character i never want to have a character who is just evil because i think that humanity is much more multifaceted than that and kind of cardboard cut out villains they don't feel real to me and um, if they don't feel re real to me, then I know that they won't feel real for a reader. Um, so I wanted kind of I wanted him to, as I say, to feel rounded and flawed where his kind of his impulses like which are normal human impulses like, I don't know, vanity or a hunger for fame or recognition can drive someone to commit these outrageous wrongs, which I suppose, you know, some of the things he does could be termed as evil. But he himself wasn't, if that makes sense. Um, and. I suppose my feelings about Jasper um, personally as a writer is that, you know, he commits a great amount of harm and damage in the book, which is not a likable trait, of course. I mean, how, how could it be? Um, but there are elements about his personality, too, that a reader might identify with. And that, too, can be quite unsettling and even interesting, I think. Um, and yeah, I'm really glad that you sort of picked up on that idea of kind of exploitation versus empowerment, because that was mm. something which I was thinking about throughout the writing of the book. Um, you know, it was a line that, uh, the writing and the research of the book, and it was a line that I really wanted to explore because I think there's a huge amount of nuance and a huge amount of interest in that. Um, so, you know, on the one hand, Jasper's shows, and there were many, many real shows like his. Um, well, on the one hand, he is unquestionably exploitative and the shows themselves were. On the other hand, they did offer opportunity to people like Nell, um, so, yeah, I, I guess I didn't want to come down on one side or the other. I think that there aren't any easy answers, um, but it was just so many of the characters respond in different ways to the show. And I felt that that would have been quite true to life.
Yeah, I love that phrase that you had, the exploitation versus empowerment. And that's truly a big theme of the story. So anyone watching, if you also felt that theme or you have any comments about that, please drop them in the in the comment section, too. So speaking of themes, um, you sort of mentioned the myth of Icarus, um, you know, a couple of times and this idea of flying too close to the sun. Um, can you talk a little bit about, you know, sort of uh, why you pulled that myth in, you know, why you pulled that reference in and maybe the ways that sort of Jasper and Icarus, uh, you know, unfortunately have maybe flown too close to the sun? <laughs> Yeah, of, of course. So, um, so um, when I was writing about the circus, um, I became really interested in the idea of stories and narratives and how they can shape someone and shape a character, especially mm -hmm. someone who is sort of as an impressionable as Nell, who has so many other people's ideas of her and who she is and what she represents kind of forced on her. Um, and, you know, in a way, all of circus, just the very nature of circus, right, is about kind of storytelling and deceit. And Jasper himself, he creates this version of Nell, you know, she becomes the queen of the moon and stars, you know, famous across the world. But to Nell, that doesn't feel like herself, and she longs to be the author of her own story. Um, so the myth of Daedalus and Icarus, you know, that that underpins a lot of the book, you know, and it's kind of playing with that idea of kind of so many stories being echoes of each other and how much truth is there in them. And, you know, of course, the, the story itself, it's a, it's, it's a story of um, pride and hubris and blind ambition um, and whether a world assembled kind of with vanity will come crashing down. Um, and at one point in the book, you know, uh, Jasper and Toby, you know, they, I suppose a bit like we were talking about before about perspective, they both interpret this story very differently. So to Toby, who is this kind of this shy, um, haunted by his past kind of figure, for him, the story is that, you know, you should stay hidden away and that you should never try um, because it's better to be safe. But to mm -hmm. Jasper, you know, um, he reads this as, you know, it, it's better to go out there and fly and fly close to the sun than never to have tried at all. Um, and that, of course, is is kind of what what might cause his downfall. Um, and yeah, that he doesn't see the stupidity. He doesn't see the senselessness of it, the recklessness and um, that kind of that kind of, I don't know, that the, the miscommunication, the different way that both of them see the same thing is kind of the, I suppose, the unpicking of both of their futures. Yeah. Wow. Love that. And, you know, another big theme that you kind of just picked up on in your answer to that one, too, was um, kind of the, the deceit. And I found that so interesting mm -hmm. that you were able to, like, weave this theme of... Um, of deceit and like uh, secrecy and fiction into the circus, which is all about that and deceit and tricks and stuff like that. Um, because Toby and Jasper, um, you know, in the book are kind of haunted by this war that they were in the Crimean war. I hope I'm saying that correctly. Um, where they, where it was kind of like falsely displayed to the public, um, which you said was a big thing during that mm. time period. Um, and I love just how you weave those to the circus and this, you know, the time period of, you know, falsely displaying truths. Um, so, yeah, I'd love for you to just talk on that theme a little bit, too, and, and um, how you were able to just like weave the theme of the circus into that that historical event. Um, so uh, when, when I was writing the book, you know, the the Crimean War, it felt sort of so detached. And now, of course, all of the stuff coming out with Ukraine and the war in Crimea, it feels sort of weirdly prescient. Um, but, you know, I, I suppose the, the Crimean War of the 19th century, it was a war that I've, I've found fascinating ever since I learned more about it. You know, it's, it's, what, it's, it's a war about storytelling and a war about mythology. And it felt like those things were kind of the perfect echo of the circus and they could kind of those two things knocking against each other, it could draw out the kind of the, the pomp and bravado of war, which was almost circus-like. But then on the other side, you've got, you know, the darkness and the disturbing side to the circus. 
Um, and just just to give a tiny bit more information about the war, I won't I won't go into too much detail, though I could you know nerd out on this war for for days. But um, it was the first war uh, where the invention of the loads of inventions meant that it changed mm. completely um, how war was kind of seen and reported on. So there was the telegraph. And that meant that um, journalists could report immediately from it. And with that came these conflicting accounts of what was happening where, you know, war photographers and artists, they they complicated this pi picture. Um, and so there is there is Toby um, and he has been tasked with creating photography propaganda, um, which to him, it feels like a lie. And while Jasper, he'll spin any story for an audience, Toby won't. And it's this kind of sense of worthlessness that he gets from the war that leads him to commit something pretty terrible. Um, but the war, the war itself, too, was this war of spectacle where, you know, um, I couldn't believe it when I was researching it, you know, that lady tourists would travel on steamers and they'd watch naval battles from the water. Um, and there was this sense of war as show. And I suppose it was for all of these reasons that I wanted to include um, the Crimean War um, which kind of threw everything in the circus into a different light. Yeah, such such a brilliant way to weave in the the circus setting and the time period. I love that. Yeah, um, and I, I it want... seems to have frozen for me actually. So um, we can hear you loud and clear. It all seems good on our end. I'm but just I going did... to leave the broadcast and come back in. Okay, while we have that break, I did want to remind everyone that we have a giveaway going on. Um, we are going to be giving away a copy of the Circus of Wonders if you have not read the book already. Um, we'll be giving away five copies. So in order to enter for a chance to win, please just ask a question in the comment section of this video. We've got a couple questions coming in now that we'll ask Elizabeth when she hops back on. Um, and that'll enter you for a chance to win. So we'll do as many, we'll do our best to answer as many questions as we can. And Elizabeth, I think she's back. We can get her on screen. Hi there. Hi. Um, I was just reminding everyone about our giveaway. We do have some audience questions I'd love to talk about. So Lucille asks what your writing process is like, which I love just hearing about authors. Like, do you, you know, are you one of those people that plan things out? Do you have to be in front of a window? Are you, you know, the story <laughs> in your head or something like that? I'd love to just like hear about your your process as an author. Uh, yeah, so uh, I think my idea of kind of being a writer, uh, before I started writing was sort of very different. Like I sort of imagined like, oh, I'd go for this walk and I'd be like really inspired by, I don't know, some some beautiful scene that I saw. And then I'd kind of come home and, you know, do a little bit of writing. But my my, my writing life is, it, I guess it actually resembles my, my husband's job as a lawyer much more than I would actually like to admit. So it really is, uh, you know, that, that famous writing quote, quote about writing, you know, it's 90% bum on chair. That is definitely the case for for my, my writing process. I suppose in terms of how I approach a novel, I plan in meticulous detail. Um, I have an Excel spreadsheet where I, which I kind of populate with every single chapter and what I want to happen in every single chapter. And that doesn't mean that I don't veer from it because I often do, I realize that something's happening too soon or too slowly, or, you know, I want a different perspective on something but um, I sort of need that structure. So yeah, it's just a very, very structured, very methodical sitting at my desk, um, working my th way through a book. Um, and that, that sounds very boring, but unfortunately that, that is my process. I'd like to have something more interesting to share, but. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. I mean, you know, it's how the work gets done and how the magic's made. So, mm -hmm. it's, you know, you have your, your strategies and kind of along the same, um, the same, like maybe the opposite. Um, Sylvia would like to know about your editing process. So was maybe this is a great time. Was there any like big um, changes mm. that you realized you had to make in the editing process or, um, you know, in this process of publishing the book? Uh, yeah, and I absolutely love being edited, actually. It's my favorite part of the process uh, because you know, up until that point, it's me kind of by myself in a room. Um, and I remember reading um, actually an interview with Phoebe Waller-Bridge where she was talking about, um, she was just like, oh yeah, I had like my my storyboarding team there. And I was like, where's my storyboarding team? <laughs> you know, this is, it's just me for so long, you know, but by, by myself. Um, and, you know, that the, as an author, you, you have to be able to do so much, you know, I don't have a storyboarding team. Um, 
But then when it comes to the editing process, that's where it becomes more collaborative. And I enjoyed that so much more, kind of bouncing ideas back and forward. And um, my editor kind of drew out a lot more, you know, around sort of timelines, you know, about making, mm. we were talking about the Crimean War, you know, making that much more relevant to the circus and making sure that those kind of threads work alongside each other. Because I think when you've been staring at a screen for however long and you, you need a different perspective and things that you think are working because you've gone over them so many times you can't you you sort of forget that a reader's coming in completely fresh um so i'd say that the editing process was extremely positive um and extremely enjoyable because it's just it's just really nice to get some some feedback and some encouragement and to really turn the book into what i first envisaged it could be yeah, absolutely. That's great. I'm so happy that you love the editing process too. Um, and then this is a good question because you are in England. Diane says that the UK version, she really loved, she has that version because she's in the UK um, and she loved that cover. I've seen that cover as well. Both covers are just so beautiful and fit the scene of the circus and Victorian age so well. Um, did you you know, I know that authors have a, you know, there's a process to creating the book covers, um, but did you have any say in either of them or were you fond of a particular one? Um, I didn't have a say in either of them, which is actually the way I like it. <laughs> um, because I, I feel that, you know, I, I, I'm not a cover designer. I don't, you know, work in marketing for books. What I can do is write. And that's what I really enjoy doing. And, you know, I, I don't know what is, is right for a market or what is eye catching on what isn't. And so I'm actually kind of quite happy to, to leave that to the professional artists. Um, so I, I, I loved both of my both of my novels. It feels like really uh, both of my novels, both of my covers. Uh, sorry. That's like, sorry. <laughs> yeah, there it is. Uh, and I love what both of them say about the book. They kind of come at it from different angles I love that both of them have Nell at the center of it in particular you know that that she's really there at the as the focus of the 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 American cover you know that beautiful silhouette of her there's the the showman's hat kind of almost inviting the reader into the book and saying like look what tricks we've got for you <laughs> um but yeah I think cover designers are genius and I would not dare to um, off of my own cover. <laughs> <laughs> You're the writer, right? <laughs> I, I totally agree with I, I Cover design is, I'm just always amazed by um, how they get it right so often, um, how mm. they really pull out the right elements and the right color and the right, you know, um, imagery and everything. Um, and I, I agree. I love that Nell is on the, the front and forefront of this. Um, she, she so deserves it. <laughs> Awesome. Oh, wow. We've got some more audience questions coming in. We've got about five more minutes, but we'll ask some, some more. I'll answer um, as quickly as I can. We can yeah. do my questions. <laughs> Micah was wondering, do you have a specific method to picking your character names or is it random? This is cool because you have such great character names. Mm. Uh, well, all of the, both of my female characters, Iris from the Doll Factory and Nell from Circus of Wonders, of course they have like my two favorite girl names, but before I name my characters, I always have to say to my husband, you know, what do you think of this girl's name? Because I have to make sure that he doesn't like it. So then it won't be our child's name, basically. <laughs> but uh, oh. I, 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 you know, I, I have a um, kind of a, I, I guess it's a, the, the, the most popular children's names of uh, something like 1850. And I think different names kind of say different things. Like Jasper to me is quite a sort of, an outgoing, unusual, kind of bright, sparkling name, whereas Toby feels sort of more dependable. Um, and there's even a line in that song in Juno, which is like, I never met a Toby I didn't like. And I think that that, that for me, is what the name Toby says. Um, yes. So. Love that. that and I, and I try and think, you know, what the name evokes to me and hope that it will also evoke a certain personality in, in, to the reader. Yeah. So Elizabeth, um, book clubs absolutely just love your books. Um, I think that they always offer something to talk about, something to think about. Um, and we hear that you are working on another. Um, so we're just wondering if you could just maybe give us a little glimpse into um, what might be coming next. Sure. Um, so I am writing my third one, but I also have a six month old baby um, who is called neither Nell nor Iris because um, it is a boy. <laughs> and uh, 
I, I'm sort of trying, trying my best to write sort of in his naps and with a with a little bit of childcare. But um, my next one, which I am enjoying so much in the in the little kind of slivers of time when I can write it, and it's also set in Victorian England, and it's about tricks and twists, um, and it's set against the construction of a grand and beautiful cemetery. Oh, that oh, I sounds... love that. Yes. yes. I feel like you do atmosphere so beautifully, um, you know, that a, a cemetery setting, I'm already <laughs> feeling feeling some goosebumps. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And that kind of goes along with another question we got from the audience, Sandy. Um, she is wondering if you have any ideas about novels that aren't historical fiction. She says that your book gives me fantasy vibes, but you do a fantastic job of presenting historical wonders. And I think that's a great question because you kind of border along this magical realism realm, mm. also historical fiction. So do you have any ideas in your head for ones that are maybe genre bending? Um, not at the moment, mainly because I find the real world so interesting that I almost don't want to do anything more with it. I like to kind of, I don't know, I just like to ground my characters in the totally wild and eccentric things which, which really occurred, which to me just, you know, I, when I do my research, I'm just like, oh my goodness, oh my goodness, how is this real? How did this happen? And so I almost don't want to introduce the magical element, but I don't know, maybe maybe one day I'll write children's fiction or something like that, but um, yeah. yeah, we'll see. Um, I've got, yeah, so so many books that I want to write. <laughs> Great. So and you, you mentioned um, you, that your research, do you get an idea from your research or do you have an idea and then you do research? Good question. Ah, um, so I usually have a small idea from my research. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, with, with Circus of Wonders, it was just this tiny photograph of a bearded woman and it said unidentified bearded woman, age 23. And so it was just this tiny little fragment. And I just was desperate to know more about her, you know, what were the details of her life, you know, and, I, and, I, and the fact that I couldn't find anything was almost kind of, uh, I don't know, mm. grist to, to the imaginative mill, as it were. So, right. um right. I then, of course, in order to write it, I needed to do a huge amount of research, but it is just that little spark which kind of ignites, yeah. I guess, lots, lots and lots more. Wow. And you That's ignited a wonderful novel in Circus of Wonders. That was, it was so great. And it was so fabulous reading and talking about it with our group this month. So we really appreciate you providing such a great discussion and providing such a great book for us to discuss. So thank you so much again, Elizabeth. Um, we are kind of, yeah, we are about out of time. So thank you to Caitlin as well for joining this discussion. It was so great to chat about this novel that we both loved so much. Um, and just a remind, one last reminder to everyone, you can still post a question in the comment section to be entered to win a copy of Circus of Wonders. Um, and we will be on our Facebook group, our Instagram, so be sure to follow to be up to date with um, our next pick. Um, and thank you again, Elizabeth. Um, I guess that's all we have time for today. Bye, yeah, everyone. Thank you so much to everyone who's tuned in and asked yeah, questions. Yeah, thank you. Bye. Bye.